Pediatric Cardiac Arrest by Dr. Robert Berg. Hello, I'm Bob Berg. Uh, I'm the uh, Division Chief of Critical Care Medicine at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and I've been a career investigator in cardiac arrest and resuscitation for both children and adults. Um, what we're gonna talk about in the next few minutes is about pediatric cardiac arrest, a chance to save a life. That may seem a little bit ironic of a title. Most of us get nervous, um, feel doom, feel gloom when we uh, hear about or see uh, a cardiac arrest in a child. But in fact, this is an opportunity I'd like to convince you over the next uh, hour uh, to save somebody's life. Um, I have some, uh, I, I've uh, employed at the University of Pennsylvania. I've been an AHA volunteer, but I want to be clear that this has nothing to do with the American Heart Association or my previous roles as BLS or Impalis Committee Chair uh, or have anything to do with any of my grants. Um, but I do have some serious intellectual conflicts of interest after 25 years um, of being a cardiac arrest and CPR research scientist. So over the next 50 minutes, what we plan on going over is, number one, the history of uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation with a focus on children, uh, the epidemiology of pediatric CPR, and I'd like to convince you that it's not so rare and it's not so dismal. We'll talk a little bit about CPR quality. Uh, bottom line of it all is push hard and fast and allow full chest recoil. We'll talk a little bit about post-resuscitation care, an important issue over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And then the hot new stuff, which is duration of CPR and debriefing, two exciting areas that are um, with recent information. History of Pediatric CPR. So in the mid-1950s, um, there was a problem of uh, people getting cardiac arrest because they bumped into high wires that were high voltage in the, in the United States. Uh, the former um, dean of the uh, Johns Hopkins School of Engineering, uh, Cowenhoven, uh, got together with uh, uh, his young collaborators, uh, Guy Knickerbocker and uh, Jim Jude, and they had a, a, um, a grant to look at defibrillation. At the time, defibrillators were the size of almost a room, and you had to bring the patient to the defibrillator rather than the defibrillator to the patient, so they were trying to come up with new ideas. While they were working with this, they took dogs, created cardiac arrest, and, um, and they, when they took the paddles to get ready to shock the dog, each time they squeezed on the paddle, they saw the arterial blood pressure rise. And they pr pressed again, it rose again, and it pressed again until they could, uh, on a regular basis, they, they looked at 100 animals and showed that um, they could keep adequate circulation for as much as 30 minutes by squeezing on these paddles. And they called this new observation closed chest massage. Jim Jude was the, um, uh, was uh, a uh, cardiothoracic surgery fellow at Johns Hopkins, and they had a patient in the PACU, which at that time was the hallway at Johns Hopkins in the 1950s, who had a cardiac arrest. And he did the same thing he did in the animals, but instead of squeezing from the sides, he put his hands on the chest and did the same sort of forceful um, uh, compressions, uh, uh, which was called in that article closed chest massage, but really was a quite um, vigorous uh, um, um, active uh, uh, compression. And the first woman survived and went home. They, in fact, in total, did it on 20 patients, all of whom had asphyxia in the operating room. 20 of 20 of them survived the cardiac arrest, and 14 of the 20 were long-term survivors, which is still the best outcome of any cardiac arrest study ever before or after that's uh, had that many patients in it. Importantly, the next article that they uh, published by Jude Cowenhoven and uh, Knickerbocker was in 1961, and you can see this picture here, where the kinds of blood pressures that they attained with the um, CPR that they were providing was nowhere near uh, what you would expect from something as, uh, as benign sounding as cardiac massage. You can see here that uh, on this 39-year-old man, the blood pressure was 150 over uh, 40. Uh, in this 60-year-old man, it was uh, approximately 110 over 40. To get those kinds of pressures required very vigorous um, CPR. In that same article, a, a third picture that they showed was the arterial blood pressure in an eight-year-old post-op cardiac surgery, and we have blood pressures of 110 over 30 um, during CPR. This was vigorous, aggressive chest compressions. As one of the parents once told me after CPR was done uh, on their child in our intensive care unit, that wasn't just compressions, that was a violent act, and thank you very much for doing it because you brought my child back to life. At the same time in Baltimore, 
um, over uh, at Baltimore City Hospital, the young Peter Saffron was showing a, a novel idea about how to provide mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. The A and B of the A, a B's and C's of uh, CPR were, were discovered at this time. They were concerned um, uh, at, at the time about how to give adequate ventilation. The A's and B's and C's, the airway and breathing of Peter Saffer and the circulation uh, that was put together by Cowenhoven et al. were put together in what, with the modern uh, ABC's of CPR. About 20 years later, 25 years later, uh, Dave Nichols and others at uh, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, where I'm now at, took a look at um, what happened during those 20 years when they did CPR in their hospital. And they, uh, showed 18 children that had a asystole. Two of the 18, about 10%, survived to discharge, and none of them survived after more than two doses of epinephrine. A young Vinay Nadkarni then similarly did a study uh, at National Children's Hospital in DC showing that 53 pulseless arrests occurred in these children, and again, five out of 53, or about 10%, survived to, to discharge the hospital. And again, none of them survived if they needed more than two doses of epi, and none of them survived when CPR was greater than 10 minutes. And from these two studies came the concept that that outcomes from cardiac arrest in children were quite poor. Uh, preventing it was better than, uh, than uh, um, treating it. And here is the next slide that comes from the initial PALS course, the Pediatric Advanced Life Support course of the American Heart Association, looking at the outcome of respiratory versus cardiopulmonary arrest in children, showing that the survival rate was excellent if it was a respiratory rate arrest, but if you wait till it's a cardiopulmonary arrest and the heart stops, outcomes were really terrible. So the original courses focused on diagnosis of treatment and treatment of respiratory failure and shock and prevention of cardiopulmonary arrest and really didn't spend much time on cardiopulmonary arrest because it was considered a rare event with dismal outcomes. Epidemiology of Pediatric CPR. Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of epidemiologic data that I'm, I hope will convince you that, that those assumptions weren't quite true. First of all, um, I'm going to give you information from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute and the Canadian equivalent on the Resuscitation Outcome Consortium, which provides EMS out-of-hospital cardiac arrest um, um, information epidemiology on a population initially of 21 million and now 23 million. Um, and you can see the various centers uh, um, that were involved. Uh, in the first pediatric study to come out of this, we uh, showed Diane Atkins and, and others of us looked at population-based incidence from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and showed that for under one year of age, the incidence was relatively similar to that in adults and was about um, one order of magnitude less common in kids that were one year to 19 years of age. Now, of course, there are many, many, many more uh, adults than there are kids less than one year of age. So it's much more common to have an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in an adult, but in any given year, it was about the same incidence in um, kids under a year of age as it was in adults. So is it rare? Well, if you take that data and uh, when it was gathered and you um, uh, look at the number of children with cardiac arrest and the number of months in the population of the United States, that would estimate that somewhere around 5,000 children in the United States each year would have a cardiac arrest. And there are many diseases we take care of in our intensive care units that are much less common than 5,000 per year. Um, so it's not so rare, in fact. How about as a dismal? As this slide shows from that same data, um, the kids 1 uh, to 19 years of age had about a 9% survival compared to adults with a 4.5% survival. And across the whole board, um, children have much better survival rates than adults. One thing I'd like to emphasize is the under one year of age kids, probably about a third of them had sudden infant death syndrome, although the study did, did not have uh, um, adequate information about that because of the nature of the study. Nearly every other study shows about a third to half of the patients with out of hospital cardiac arrest in the first year of life are due to SIDS. And those patients frequently wake up in the morning and they've been dead all night long. So it's not surprising their outcome is poor. If you take them out, the, the survival rate under a year of age is pretty close to that for uh, those uh, that are adults. And between 1 and 19 is much better. In this slide, we, we look in Japan with very similar data showing, again, with almost 1,000 patients, it almost looks like identical data, 9% survival in the 5 to 12-year-old range. 
and uh, overall kids had um, a 50% higher survival rate than adults and favorable neurological outcome rate was also higher among children than adults. Um, so nobody's saying that we shouldn't be doing CPR on adults and yet some people have said in the past we shouldn't do it in children when in fact their outcomes are better. More recent data from the PCAR network, the Pediatric Emergency Care um, Research Network in the United States, they looked at 138 children from 15 sites, about 20% were at our hospital, the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, that had one minute of chest compressions and then had return of, of circulation for at least 10 minutes. 38% of them survived to discharge. Those are the ones that made it to you. Remember, a lot of them didn't survive to get to your hospital, but of those that that, um, that had that much uh, return of spontaneous circulation, most of whom came to intensive care units. 56% had favorable neurological outcomes, but importantly, one third of them had severe disabilities. How about in the PICU? So uh, I'm an intensive care doctor and uh, Tony Slonim and Murray Pollack showed in the mid 1990s that almost 2% of PICU admissions in 32 PICUs in the United States, had, um, uh, there were, there was a, the patient had at least two minutes of CPR. Looking at Adrian Randolph's data, um, looking at the, at the frequency of uh, admissions to, cardi uh, to intensive care units in the United States, somewhere in the range of five to 10,000 um, PICU CPR events happen every year. So PICU CPR is at least as common as uh, CPR uh, out of hospital. It's an important problem. It's not rare. This has been repeated last year by us in the uh, Collaborative Pediatric Critical Care Research Network of the NIH in our PICU uh, CPR, the Pediatric Intensive Care Quality CPR pilot data. We showed, again, that, between, that about 1.5% of the PICU admissions in uh, the year 2012 at these major institutions um, uh, ended up in having cardiac arrest. So somewhere around 1 in 50 to 1 in 70 kids that come, are admitted to an intensive care unit end up having CPR um, provided to them. This is not a rare event. Next thing I'd like to show you a little data is national data from, from the American Heart Association from the Get With the Guidelines Resuscitation database. This includes over 500 hospitals and more than 200,000 adult and pediatric cardiac arrests. Um, and the pediatric arrests are, are uh, just under 10,000. In the first of these studies from this, uh, again by V99 Kearney, uh, and, uh, and others of us um, showed that of the first uh, almost 1,000 kids that had a cardiac arrest, 60% had return of spontaneous circulation. We were able to bring them back at least um, initially. Almost half of them did not survive the, t the first 24 hours. And 27% or less than half of them survived to hospital discharge. But those who did survive to hospital discharge, 81% had relatively favorable neurological outcome. That is, they were walking and talking. So um, unlike the, the uh, um, out of hospital cardiac arrest, which had a substantial number of patients that were devastated uh, and relatively few that uh, were only about half of them had favorable neurological outcomes, it's up to 80% for in hospitals in this study. And it's important to know that the immediate cause of death in these studies uh, from pediatric and adult in hospital cardiac arrests, about half are due to respiratory um, insufficiency acutely, and half are due to hypotension. And you, if you look at these numbers, you'll see that they add up to more than 100% because many patients have both. Most importantly, the children have much better outcomes than adults. 27% of children survive to hospital discharge versus 18% of adults and with an adjusted odd ratio of 2.3 because children were more, much less likely to have VF and VT uh, and had other adverse factors. These are absolute numbers and they ignore the very important issue about potential years of life gained. A pediatric survivor of a cardiac arrest has a much, more, much greater opportunity to live uh, many, many more years. So I'd like to say pediatric resuscitation, it's worth the effort. CPR quality. When I talk about um, cardiac arrest, I like to think about four phases. I like to think about the pre-arrest phase, and there's a certain set of things we can do to prevent cardiac arrest. The no-flow phase, when there's untreated arrest, and what we should do then. The low-flow phase, or what Peter Saffer, one of the fathers of uh, modern CPR, would call the trickle-flow CPR, where we just get a, some flow with CPR, but not enough. And then the post-resuscitation phase, uh, what happens afterwards, a focus of the last 10 years that really has um, had us re-energize and rethink about what we can do for cardiac arrest.
So first of all, the pre-rest phase. Uh, simple. Prompt diagnosis and treatment of respiratory failure and shock should be able to prevent cardiac arrest. In motor vehicle accidents, uh, you can help by having kids in their seat belts so that they don't have a cardiac arrest. And there's a whole host of things that we can do in other settings. It's the, co it's the focus of the PALS course. It's the focus of the, of the uh, um, whole movement for medical emergency teams or rapid response teams. Uh, studies from, uh, uh, um, from Stanford and from Melbourne show that we can have fewer deaths and fewer non-ICU codes um, by having these uh, medical emergency teams. The second, and no small issue, is that we should monitor critically ill children. In fact, um, the bottom part of this slide I showed about 15 years ago uh, at a major conference and people were ready to throw me off the stage. I said a non-ICU pediatric cardiac arrest is a sentinel event, a potentially avoidable medical error. And people in the audience thought I was some sort of crazy loon. But in fact, as you know now, in the United States, with the Children's um, uh, Health Care uh, um, Association, CHA, we now believe that non-ICU pediatric cardiac arrest should be avoided. And as this slide shows, recent data from Get With the Guidelines Resuscitation um, shows that in the latter half of the last decade, 95% of the cardiac arrests in ICUs and wards happen in ICUs. So we have effectively moved from less than 90% to up to 95% of, of those arrests are happening in the uh, ICU because we've been able to move the patients earlier. And most importantly, that's resulted in better outcomes, a higher rate of, uh, ret of uh, return of spontaneous circulation and survival uh, with favorable neurological outcomes. And that'll be coming in press in critical care medicine soon. So that's the pre-rest phase. How about the no-flow phase? Bottom line of that is do something. Push hard, push fast, allow full chest recoil, minimize interruptions, and don't overventilate. In hospitals, get the patient to the ICU before where they can be monitored for cardiac arrest and treat them promptly instead of having a prolonged period. That sounds trivial, but an important issue for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest is only about a third of kids that have out-of-hospital cardiac arrest have bystander CPR. It is unbelievable that some people, there's a call to EMS, six to 12 minutes later, the, the emergency medical system arrives, they do CPR, and some of them survive. The truth of the matter is that prolonged no-flow state um, is, is a, a, a terrible um, um, a factor leading to death. Low-flow phase, CPR. Chest compressions provide the entire cardiac output. The stroke volume depends on pushing hard. The heart rate depends on how fast you push it. Well, how good can we be in CPR? Well, the data aren't perfectly clear in kids, but in our animal models, we can show that a cardiac output uh, in uh, pediatric animal models um, can be 10 to 25% of normal with CPR. That means that the blood flow is about 10 to 25% of normal, and that normal ventilation isn't necessary. We can ventilate a little bit lower than that because blood flow is only 10 to 25% of normal. So we have a tendency to want to bag real fast and breathe real fast when it's really not necessary. Uh, and in fact, that very high intrathoracic pressure from rapid um, rates of ventilation can result in high intrathoracic pressure and impede blood return to the chest. Interestingly, myocardial and cerebral blood flow can be greater than 50% of normal um, sinus rhythm during CPR. How can that be so big? Well, you get vasoconstriction elsewhere and your blood flow is predominantly to the heart and to the brain. And you can get actually quite good flow, which is why we can have so many good um, outcomes. One of my uh, colleagues at the University of Arizona, Art Sanders, uh, an emergency medicine specialist, showed in, in 1984 that coronary perfusion pressure, that is the aortic diastolic pressure minus the right atrial pressure during CPR, is the critically important determinant of successful CPR. It turns out that when you push on the chest, you squeeze on the um, myocardium. When it gets squeezed on, the microvasculature uh, has a very high resistance and nothing flows through from the epicardium into the um, uh, heart. And we've done some studies with uh, Doppler showing minimal flow during the compression phase. Uh, Carl Kern, another one of my uh, associates uh, when I was at the University of Arizona, an interventional cardiologist, showed very nicely that coronary perfusion or myocardial perfusion was a predictor of 24-hour survival as well. That um, when the coronary perfusion pressure was less than 20, 
at 10 minutes of CPR, 96% of the animals could not attain return of spontaneous circulation. So having a high enough pressure is critical uh, um, to perfuse those hearts. And then the limited data we have in humans is norm parity is showing in, in a really astounding set of studies that were done at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan, that patients came in with CPR. They put in arterial catheters in the emergency department, um, he and Manny Rivers and others, uh, and they measured um, the coronary perfusion pressure, and there was a dose response curve as shown in this slide. If the CPP was less than zero, was less than 15, none of them had a return of spontaneous circulation. Half of them did when it was 15 to 25, and 80% uh, did when it was greater than 25. So there's a dose response curve of pressure to flow to outcome. This is a classic curve that's from one of our animal experiments uh, from a little more than a decade ago. And in the, in the pink is the um, arterial waveforms, and in the yellow is the right atrial waveforms. And you can see that the bottom of the pink to the bottom of the yellow is the um, coronary perfusion pressure or the pressure at the end of um, relaxation. And you can see that each time we stop to give two breaths, the aorta empties out to the periphery the uh, aortic diastolic pressure drops and it takes a while for it to build back up. So what we learned is interrupting compressions has a lot of adverse effects. First and foremost, it decreases the frequency of your compressions. That drops your um, uh, cardiac output by dropping the heart rate. It de there's a decrement in aortic diastolic pressure. There's lower left ventricular myocardial blood flow. We measured that as well. Uh, and it resulted in worse outcomes. So the bottom line is minimize interruptions. So Phillips and Lairdall made a, um, uh, this uh, um, defibrillator that you could work that, ha that had associated with it a chest compression sensor that has a, um, uh, an accelerometer in it. With it, you can measure the chest compression rate, depth, force, and residual leaning. My colleagues at uh, Children's Hospital Philadelphia, Bobby Sutton and V9 Nod Kearney, decided uh, in, in 2006 to um, start measuring CPR quality of CHOP. And for those two-year periods, you can see that um, a very high percentage of the uh, uh, children did not get the rate that you wanted. That's 43% did not get the rate wanted. 36% did not get the depth that we were trying for. And 36% uh, did not get the um, absence of leaning on the chest that we were hoping for. Or said in the other way, only about 60% got each of the, the uh, correct rate depth and, and uh, absence of leaning that we were expecting. It was written in that article by Bobby and uh, Vinay that, uh, that this was terrible CPR and that they have a long way to go to get better. But the truth of the matter is it was the best quality CPR study uh, that had been published to that point. They had better quality than any of the adult studies that had been published. And interestingly, um, uh, just published in 2013, um, our group has looked at um, whether when we push down a third to half of the chest compression depth, do we get that aortic diastolic pressure of 30, which will give us a coronary perfusion pressure around 20, just like we said we need in the animals, and lo and behold, luckily, pushing down that far was about the right amount um, to get adequate pressures that would predict that you'd have better outcomes. We'll get back to that more in a little bit. Vina Nakarni came up with this brilliant idea at CHOP uh, to look uh, with a mobile cart with a mannequin to provide 30 to 90 seconds of insight to CPR practice with feedback to optimize CPR skills. So you can see this um, mannequin with a force transducer on him. And you can see that the cart that would go by the bedside, they would ask on the five sickest kids in the unit, they would come on over and the, uh, the CPR group goes over to the nurse by the bedside and has them practice 30 to 90 seconds of CPR. Well, does that make any difference? It turns out, surprisingly to me, that highly refreshed teams, that is teams that had at least two providers that had had refreshments, just 30 to 60 to 90 seconds of CPR practice within the last four months, um, the, uh, the frequency of chest compressions of adequate depth went from 70% up to 88%. So practice improves your performance. None of us would think about taking a ball and throwing it someplace once every two years and then think we could throw the ball across the plate well or kick a soccer ball into a net 
once and then two years later be able to perform well uh, at, the, at the most important time to perform in the world. Yet somehow we think that we can do CPR once every two years and be able to perform well. Instead of four hours of CPR once every two years, just doing every few months, 30 to 90 seconds, is enough to make a big difference in outcome. No surprise to any of us. Uh, it also published in 2013, Bobby Sutton showed that, uh, in our whole group, that adequate blood pressures depend on adequate chest compression rate and depth. And you can see that if you did the rate greater than 100 and the depth greater than 38 millimeters, um, your chances of having a systolic blood pressure above 80, what they showed that they could do in 1960 and had those excellent outcomes was twofold more likely. And the diastolic pressure greater than 30, the kind that would, would get you a coronary perfusion above 20, was 1.5 times more likely. So adequate blood pressures do in fact depend on adequate chest compression rate and depth in our pediatric ICUs. And what we did is we did a study looking at a pediatric model to see if there was any effect of leaning. Um, and we looked at the pressures um, during CPR. And we took a look at a group of animals that had no leaning and then one that had 10% leaning and 20% leaning. And um, as you look at the pressures, they're not very much different. The coronary perfusion pressure dropped from 22 to 19 to 17. But those low numbers um, seem to be unlikely to make a difference. However, in the low flow state of CPR, slight differences in pressures make huge differences in flow. So as this slide shows, myocardial blood flow uh, dropped by almost a half and cardiac index dropped um, by almost a half. Well, how common does leaning occur? Well, leaning of greater than 2.5 kilograms, which was more than, um, uh, which was about 20% in most of these uh, uh, children, occurred in 13% of the chest compressions. So leaning is common and leaning has adverse effects. Do we have the right goals? Should the goals be based on mechanics, go a depth or go a rate? Or should it be based on hemodynamics? Blood pressures, like we do with anything else that we do in medicine, we would look at, um, we would, certainly wouldn't go in the operating room and say, um, the chest should move by this amount uh, when we ventilate. We'd look at the end tidal CO2. We certainly wouldn't say, I should give you this amount of epinephrine. I'd look at the blood pressure. So should we be looking at hemodynamics? Uh, this study from resuscitation, uh, again by Bobby Sutton and our group of investigators at CHOP, showed that when we switch from a, uh, from a guideline-directed, depth-directed CPR with giving epinephrine every four minutes as per the guidelines, that the outcomes were not nearly as good as when we did it by hemodynamic goal directing. We took a swine model that um, we gave them seven minutes of asphyxia, clamped the two. Then we did 10 minutes of um, CPR and we either gave um, what we call realistic, which was the depth that is typically measured in hospitals, or the um, 2010 goals, a, a deeper, the greater than 50 millimeters, and we gave the epinephrine whether they needed it or not every four minutes. And we compared that to hemodynamic goals, which was we, we didn't give the epi if it wasn't needed because the blood pressures were high enough, and if the blood pressures dropped down, we gave more frequent epi until we got it up there. The two groups got approximately the same amount of epinephrine, and the survival rate, as you can see, was dramatically better with hemodynamic goals than with um, uh, the standard system that we use without paying attention to flow. Good pediatric advanced life support begins with good basic life support. Push hard, push fast, allow the chest to recoil, that is, don't lean, and minimize your interruptions, and that will get you the best outcome from um, children in cardiac arrest. So you all know this algorithm from the American Heart Association. CPR, again, in the center of it is push hard, push fast, don't interrupt, breathe slowly, and seek reversible causes. And if it's, if you do an electrocardiogram and you see a VFVT, we shock. That doesn't work, we give epinephrine. We keep doing compressions and then we shock again. And then we can use an antiarrhythmic. If on the other hand, there's no VF or VT, we give epinephrine and we do CPR for two minutes and we uh, continue to uh, seek reversible causes and provide CPR. So in the past we've taught CPR by um, a series of boxes 
that made it look like one person was providing care and just going from step to step. But in fact, that's not how we work in medicine. We work as an integrated team and there's multiple players at once. It's sort of like thinking of a football game or a basketball game as each, the ball gets thrown to one person, there's nobody else on the, on the court and then you get passed to another person, there's nobody else on the court. That's not how it works. There's a team working. An integrated team can give a simultaneous choreographed approach. The first rescuer who has his hands available can start doing chest compressions instead of having the first box say airway and breathing and running around looking for a bag and mask. The next rescuers simultaneously can be one person getting the rhythm detection and getting a defibrillator while another person is getting a bag mask or ventilation. Um, back to our, our earlier study the, that um, from uh, the NRCPR that's not called Get With The Guidelines Resuscitation. We looked at almost 1,000 kids. 60% have return of spontaneous circulation. 24 hours later, almost half of them were no longer alive. And by discharge, there was 27% survival. Remember these numbers. This is just one decade ago. Yet now, um, we knew there was a drop off one decade ago, and we knew that before then. And finally, in the year 2008, the American Heart Association published the postcardiac arrest syndrome. The whole concept that a lot of things happen post arrest and there's things we can do about it. The first of those things that we could do about it that was uh, published in 2002 were these two articles in the New England Journal of Medicine showing that mild therapeutic hypothermia could improve outcomes for after cardiac arrest both in Europe in the HACA study and uh, by Steve Bernard in uh, um, uh, Melbourne. And Everybody says that mild therapeutic hypothermia improved neuro outcome, but actually, as you see this slide, it improves survival and neuro outcome by about the same amount um, and was quite effective. However, what most people don't know from that study is that hypotension occurred in half, over half of the patients in the HACA study and that more than half of the patients in Bernard's study received epinephrine for hemodynamic support. Myocardial dysfunction and hemodynamic dysfunction with, uh, during cardiac arrest are the norm. This is a study published by our group in Arizona in 1996 that for the first time looked at cardiac output along with um, uh, the same year uh, a study by Max Harry Weil and uh, Tang. And as you can see from, from the uh, graph here that the cardiac output drops by almost a half by, within 30 minutes, stays down during that day and comes back up the next day. Very similar to post-pump myocardial dysfunction and very similar to um, sepsis-associated myocardial dysfunction. It's a myocardial stunning. It's a reversible myocardial depression without concomitant myocardial ischemia. The L, there's LV systolic and diastolic dysfunction. There's right ventricular systolic and diastolic dysfunction. And there's activation of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Virtually every cytokine that's been shown to be abnormal post-pump or associated with um, uh, systemic inflammatory response has also been shown in the uh, post-cardiac arrest. Uh, in fact, some people refer to it as a sepsis-like syndrome. Um, Carl Kern uh, and, and my other colleagues at the University of Arizona showed that we could obviate that by uh, treating with dobutamine. And you can see from the slide that you can prevent the drop in cardiac output, in this case, left ventricular ejection fraction, by giving dobutamine. And there have been multiple other ways to approach it. Soon after this was studied, the uh, Yves Laurent in, um, uh, in Paris uh, uh, gathered data on um, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest patients in Paris and showed that over half the adults needed vasoactive drips for hypotension the first 24 hours after the cardiac arrest. Frank Moeller showed uh, in the PCARN study that I mentioned before that 70% of kids after out-of-hospital cardiac arrest were put on vasoactive drips because of hemodynamic dysfunction. So how do you treat it? Well, most of us treat with, with uh, catecholamines, although there's no controlled trials. Dobutamine, epinephrine, dopamine, and norepinephrine have all been used. Oh. And animal studies have shown milrinone and levosimendin um, as, as successful agents. The bottom line is keep up the blood pressure. Don't let the blood pressure drop in somebody who's uh, who, uh, as a second um, insult to both the heart and the brain. Post-resuscitation care. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about post-resuscitation care um, as, as, a, as a whole. What do we know? We know that we avoid hyperthermia. 
We know that we should monitor temperature and treat fever aggressively. We should consider induced hypothermia, that is 32 to 34 degrees for 24 to 72 hours. But there's, um, for those of us in pediatric, you know, the FAPCA study's on right now, and maybe that's the right thing to do, maybe not. It should be noted that even though the previous studies showed that, um, that hypothermia was better than the control group, the control group were all hyperthermic. And some people would argue that if we just brought the temperature down, we would have get, gotten all the gain without any uh, adverse effects. And most importantly, I hope that I've um, uh, emphasized that myocardial dysfunction is common after cardiac arrest. It's virtually the norm. Make sure you, keep, you, you treat that with uh, flu fluids appropriately and with vasoactive agents. Uh, the next slide shows the picture of uh, Alexis Topchin, one of the young uh, faculty members at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and she's looked uh, at seizures during hypothermia. And she's showed that with long-term continuous EEG monitoring of these patients that came in after cardiac arrest, that almost half of them had seizures, they were mostly non-convulsive, and especially occurred during rewarming. This has been repeated at Toronto Sick Children's and at other places. And about one-third of the patients um, had status epilepticus. Um, and that third that had status epilepticus had the worst outcomes. What we don't know yet is if active treatment could have prevented that status epilepticus earlier in the seizures and ended up with better outcomes. So I'm going to switch gears one more time and talk a little bit about something that's been very exciting for the last uh, decade uh, that, uh, that many of us use at our institutions, uh, ECMO CPR. Um, there were studies at, in uh, Pittsburgh, Boston, and others showing uh, small groups of patients, seven, eight, nine patients, that were put on ECMO during CPR and survived. The first large study was presented from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia looking at 66 children over seven years approximately one-third of the total ECMO at the, at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. A third of them survived a hospital discharge despite a median duration of CPR of 50 minutes. Nobody could imagine it could be true. It's important that the investigator said that there was a brief no-flow period. They started CPR immediately in the ICUs. There was excellent CPR during the low flow, although that none of them measured it. And unlike um, uh, patients not on ECMO, when you're on ECMO, you can control the post-resuscitation temperature and blood flow. So um, it was an optimal post-resuscitation phase. This brought a new paradigm in 2004. Cardiac arrest or CPR duration does not necessarily determine futility. The concept of 10 minutes or two doses of epi was totally thrown out. That study was um, uh, from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. It's been repeated by the people in Boston Children's Hospital, by Toronto Sick Kids, and at Great Ormond Street. And all four places have shown virtually identical uh, findings. In fact, so much so, it's, it's striking. New topics, duration and debriefing. I want to talk for the last little bit about uh, two really um, new, um, uh, striking, um, provocative findings. So the first one is about CPR duration. Um, in uh, about three months ago, there was an article by um, Zach Goldberger and, and, the, uh, and some of the rest of us uh, from the Get With the Guidelines resuscitation showing that adults could have CPR for more than 25 minutes and have 9% of them survive to discharge. An amazing study. I'm not going to go in much detail about that, but this month, um, in uh, uh, January of 2013, um, we have an, an article also in pediatrics showing that the adjusted probability of survival if you needed CPR for 1 to 15 minutes is now 41%. It is a chance to save a life. But more amazing is that if your CPR was more than 35 minutes, 12% survived. Now this is a biased sample, I'm sure. This is a looking at what, um, what People did what physicians and providers did in hospitals all over the United States, and, and uh, many of the patients that died, the, uh, sur the uh, provider stopped CPR before 35 minutes. Among those that they continued to do CPR for 35 minutes, among that bias sample that providers thought they had a chance, 12% survived, a number that none of us ever believed was possible. Just as striking is among those survivors, Favorable neurological uh, uh, outcomes occurred in the majority of them in both groups, and they were not statistically significant. So prolonged CPR can result in survival, and survival with good neurological outcomes.
What's most amazing about this is it sort of confuses us about what's right. When's the right time to stop? That's why this, these findings in adults I got to the front page of the New York Times. The idea about how long do you try is an important issue for physicians and for the public alike about what does it take to save my life and the scary idea about if you go too long, have you, got, have you kept somebody alive that has uh, severe neurological deficits? In both the pediatric and adult uh, trials, it looks like you've not had um, uh, a, a large price to be paid in terms of bad neurological outcomes if you could survive. But we're just at the beginning. We don't know what the right thing is to do. And nobody knows the right answer of how long do you do. This slide is looking at first adults and then kids and get with the guidelines among hospitals that have been in this get with the guidelines um, a quality improvement regimen where they keep data about how well they've been doing uh, in their hospital. Um, hospitals have been in this for uh, the last decade. You can see that the survival rate from VF and VT among adults uh, increased from 28% to 40%. And for um, a system PEA increased from 6% to almost 15%. That's a 4% adjusted rate, um, rate of uh, improvement per year over the last decade. This is the first study since the original description in the 1960s showing that we're improving outcomes with CPR at places that are um, paying attention to what they're doing. Again, in pediatrics by Jarotra and all, um, we showed among 1,000 children who had uh, CPR provided uh, during that last decade, um, the risk-adjusted survival incre uh, increased from 14% to 43%, an adjusted rate of, um, of improvement of 1.08 of or 8% per year. So again, outcomes are improving both in adults and children. And then I'm gonna say one more thing that's sort of an area of just um, uh, uh, new and stunning results. Remember I showed you that puck that they put in the chest and they give you feedback about how well you push. On that puck there's actually audio and visual feedback to tell you how hard to push and, and how to optimize your CPR. And when people turn on and turn off that feedback, the outcomes and the processes only improve a very little bit. Some of the investigators in uh, adult medicine, uh, particularly uh, Donna Edelson at the University of Chicago and um, uh, and Ben Abella at uh, the University of Pennsylvania showed that by debriefing, by showing people afterwards what, it, what their blood pressures and, and compression rates and, and compression depths were like, um, and debriefing people after cardiac arrest, that the system improved over time. But it was relatively subtle, but it was much, much more impressive than the changes that happened with, with uh, direct feedback during the chaotic event of CPR. At the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, we tried something different. In the year 2008, they decided to look at 18 months before they did debriefing and then start doing a, a different kind of debriefing at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. In our case, we decided rather than debrief individuals, we were going to do it as a whole team so all the nurses and all the fellows could be in the room and learn about uh, how the last CPR event in a, in a uh, non-confrontational uh, 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 open um, uh, communication, uh, transparent way to look at how we can improve our care. What was most striking is if you, you'd see a picture and you'd see that there's a flat wave and there's no compressions done for 10 seconds, everybody in the room said, oh my God, I was there, how did that happen? And they never let it happen again. So you can see from this slide that pre-debrief and post-debrief, um, the rate of return of spontaneous circulation increased by 10%. And the rate of survival at hospital discharge went from 31% to 51%. And the rate of survival with good neurological outcome improved from 27% to 48%. Numbers that none of us truly believed was possible in these 120 CPR events. Well, what was the mechanism of that? Well, remember in the beginning when we showed you those slides that, that only about 60% of the time did we do the right depth and the right rate and um, avoid leaning? In 2008 to 2010, before we did debriefing, we had already increased that up to uh, 70 and 80 percent um, doing good CPR as opposed to the 60 percent. After debriefing, we increased that up into the 90 percent range. So no surprise that if you improve the quality of CPR, you get better 
perfusion of your heart and your brain, and the outcomes are better. So in conclusion, I hope that I've said to you that pediatric cardiac arrests are not so rare, they're not so dismal, and increasingly they're a chance to save a life, particularly if the CPR has been done in an intensive care unit. That for pre-arrest, prevent the cardiac arrest, recognize respiratory failure and shock, put people in seat belts, avoid poisons. Once you do have um, a cardiac arrest, don't have no-flow phase, immediately just do it. Push hard, push fast, avoid interruptions, and don't lean. In the post-arrest period, manage left ventricular dysfunction. Manage, diagnose and manage um, seizures and myocardial dysfunction. Prevent hyperthermia and perhaps consider hypothermia. This data that we have right now is a beginning to a, a new future where we can save more lives. And I'd like to have my last slide show that we should be thinking in the future, should ward events that are now uncommon, should they become a no-no? Should they be a, a circumstance where uh, in the United States, a no-no means if that happens, you're not gonna get paid for it because that's, that's not acceptable outcomes. Are we really ready for a time like that? Maybe. In hospital cardiac arrest, survival rates are improving, but there's gotta be a limit. What is that limit? Let's find out what that limit is and who are the right people to be providing uh, CPR for and for how long. The duration of CPR, this is just the big new. It's new as can be and nobody really knows what to do with it. 12% survive for more than, after more than 35 minutes of CPR. None of us imagined that was possible. When should we stop? Does that mean we should go more than 35 minutes with everybody? I don't think so. But what are the characteristics that help those doctors decide that their, their patients had a better chance? And don't forget, 12% survival meant that 88% did not survive. So going long doesn't promise you anything, but stopping early promises you that those patients could not survive. And finally and last, debriefing is good. And I want to thank all the uh, uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and Penn investigators on this slide. It truly does take a village to make a difference. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.